Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the, uh, what is it, the 11th of the 10th month, which happens to be the 24th of December on the Gregorian calendar for 2022. And we are continuing in our read through of the original covenant writings. We were going through Genesis or Bereshit, and we had just got through the flood account. And now we're going to take a segue from that to read the book of Hanok which is chronologically in order here. So while this isn't directly in line because we did read to and up, you know, up to the flood and the account that happened, we're just backtracking a little bit. And then as we go, we're going to try to read the books or the writings as they came out so that we can have an idea of what was known at the time for posterity then. And you can see the progression of things. If anyone has been following along, I've talked about it numerous times, but there is a parable. It says that our creator, Yahushua, he only spoke to the people in parables, and there wasn't anything that he didn't say in parables. And that includes what he walked out himself. And you can find that truth all the way back to the beginning in the creation account. While it's literal creation of six days and the things that were made it's parables of what he would be doing the works that he did through history and or is doing through history and in the first day the seventh work was light day evening and morning the different manifestations and aspects of how light is in the world and that culminated with hanok being taught all these things the vengeance or the right ruling that was brought upon adam for his transgression and cain and the, the promise of resurrection everything that was happening in that time right before the flood these were his final works before then and this is the light that was given at that time so without further ado we're going to go ahead and get into this book this is hanok chapter one Introductory Visions and Parables of Hanok, the Righteous and the Wicked. The Baraka of Hanok, with which he Baruch, the elect and the righteous who would be present on the day of tribulation, at the time of the removal of all the wicked ones. And Hanok, the blessed or Baruch and righteous man of Yahuwah, took up his parable while his eyes were open, and he saw, and said, this is something that you also see Bilam talking about, who was a foreteller, who had his eyes wide open, right? But he said, this is a Kadosh vision from the Shemaim, with which the Melakim showed me, or sorry, which the Melakim showed me, which is messengers. And I heard from them everything, and I comprehended. I look not for this generation, but for the distant one that is coming. I speak about the elect ones and concerning them. And I took up with a parable, saying, Yahuwah of the creation, the Kadosh Great One, will come forth from his dwelling. And from there, he will march upon Mount Zion, or Mount Sinai, I'm sorry, and appear in his camp, emerging from the Shemaim with a mighty power. Now, that's the four manifestations of our Mashiach. He came from his dwelling. He, he was in the garden, right? He marched at Mount Sinai where he appeared before his people to give the commandments. He appeared in his camp that was after Mount Sinai, where he was dwelling with his people in the pillar of fire and the cloud. And then he's coming with mighty power from the Shemaim when he returns. All right. And everyone shall be afraid and watchers shall quiver. And great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. The mountains and the high places will fall down and be frightened. 
and high hills shall be made low, and they shall melt like a honeycomb before the flame. And earth shall be rent asunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish. And there shall be a judgment upon all, including the righteous. And to all the righteous he will grant shalom. He will preserve the elect, and loving kindness shall be upon them. They shall all belong to Yahuwah, and they shall prosper and be Baruch, and the light of Yahuwah shall shine unto them. Behold, he will arrive, or he will come with ten million of the Kodeshim, in order to execute judgment upon all. He will destroy the wicked ones and censor all flesh on account of everything that they have done, that which the sinners and the wicked ones committed against him. And that's quoted by Yahuda in his epistle. Examine all the activities which take place in the sky and how they do not alter their ways. And examine the luminaries of Shemaim, how each one of them rises and sets. Each one is systematic according to its respective season, and they do not divert from their appointed order. This is a refutation for everyone thinking that the luminaries are things act contrary to his will. There's multiple witnesses that talk about how he, he orders the number of the stars. He knows them all by name. They, go, they show forth him who numbers them, and they know him who names them, right? And look at the earth and turn in your mind concerning the action which is taking place in her from the beginning to the end, how all the work of Yahuwah as being manifested, does not change. And beyond the summer and the winter, how the whole earth is filled with water and clouds and dew, and he causes rain to rest upon her. Examine and observe everything, and the trees, how all their leaves appear as if they wither and had fallen, except fourteen trees whose leaves do not fall, but the old foliage remains for about two or to three years until the new leaves come. And again, examine the days of the summer, how the heat of the sun is upon the earth and dominates her. And as for you, you will crave shade and shelter on account of the heat of the sun and the earth shall burn with scorching heat, and you are not able to walk upon the earth or up on the rock on account of the heat with bare feet without getting burned, right? Observe how the verdant trees are covered with leaves and they bear fruit. Pay attention concerning all things and know in what manner he fashioned them. All of them belong to him who lives forever. And it mentions in other places that he does everything in hokma or wisdom, and it's to teach man knowledge. Literally, everything's in parables. So if you take what the waters represent and you look at it and you learn things about it, then you can learn about the conditions there. If you look about how animals behave and what they represent, or how the trees work and what they represent, there everything's in parables, and everything is you. No, no one can get to the end of these things. You can't discern everything that there is, but if you take the time to think, you will become intelligent for doing so. You'll learn wise counsel and you'll learn to fear your creator for certain. I'll give you one example. The rock badger. If you look up what the scripture says about the rock badger, and then you look up what is actually known about them, you'll see it's like a type of his assembly. You have the one who's the head, who actually has the oil glands that he anoints the others in the congregation or his flock with. He has 22 distinct sounds, he says, with his mouth. They, they go out morning and evening, and they make these noises. 
they dwell in the cleft of the rock and it's his it's the leader's job to warn when danger comes to get the flock inside the rock to, to preserve them there's a lot more to it but that's just in rock badgers and he literally has these things in everything what trees represent the seasons and what they mean everything is parables and it's it's all spoken of throughout his word that ob willing will learn as we go and you guys can see this stuff for yourselves it says his work proceeds and progresses from year to year and all his work prospers and obeys him and it does not change but everything functions in the way in which Yahuwah has ordered it. And look at the seas. They do not part. They fulfill all their duties. But as for you, have not been long-suffering, and you have not done the commandments of Yahuwah, but you have transgressed and spoken slanderously, grave and harsh words with your impure mouths against his greatness O oh, you hard-hearted may you not find shalom this is worded a little differently than i remember therefore you shall curse your days and the years of your life shall perish and multiply in eternal extrication and there will not be any mercy unto you in those days you shall make your names an eternal extrication unto all the righteous, and the sinner shall curse you continually, you together with the sinners. But to the elect there shall be light, joy, and shalom, and they shall inherit the earth. To you wicked ones, on the contrary, there will be a curse. And then Hokma shall be given to the elect, and they shall all live and not return again to sin, either by being wicked or through pride. But those who have Hokma or wisdom shall be humble and not return again to sin. And they shall not be judged all the days of their lives, nor die through plague or wrath but they shall complete the designated number of their days of their life. And shalom shall increase their lives, and the years of their happiness shall be multiplied forever in gladness and shalom all the days of their life. In those days, when the children of men had multiplied, and this is kind of a segue, the first was a, a foretelling about the end right the the forever after and the things that were going to happen and now he's having a he's telling about what was happening in his times and what happened with the watcher specifically chapter 6 through 15 here covers this section and you're going to see the origins of witchcraft which is also astrology or trying to get your your zodiac sign and all those things it might pretend and then the origins of magic, makeup, money, war, all the things that plague men today. So it's in those days when the children of men had multiplied, it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters, and the messengers, the children of Shemaim, saw them and desired them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of men, and beget us children. And Shemyaza, or Samyaza, being their leader, said unto them, I fear that perhaps you will not consent that this deed should be done, and I alone will become responsible for this great sin. But they all responded to him, let us all swear an oath and bind everyone among us by a curse not to abandon this suggestion but to do the deed then they all swore together and bound one another by the curse and they were all together two hundred 
and they descended into Ardos, which is the summit of Hermon, Mount Hermon in the land there. And they called the Mount Hermon, for they swore and bound one another by a curse. And their names are as follows, Shemyaza, the leader of Arakeb, Ramael, Tamel, Ramel, Danel, and these are abbreviated. It's not exactly how they would have been pronounced. Yehezkel, Barakiel, Azel, Armaros, Batarel, Ananel, Zakel El, Sosum Maspewel, sorry about that, Ketzarel, Torel, Yama Yolel, and Azar Azael. There's also Azazel was one of these. I don't I don't know if he was one of the fallen watchers there that had made it with women, but there was other ones that were also doing things that they shouldn't. I should point out though. It was only the 200 that mated with women and animals that begat the giants and monsters that were punished in perpetuity, buried in, in, in the earth and suffering until they're going to be pulled up on the day of judgment and tossed into the lake of fire. But the other ones are under the purview of Satan why he he's a, a fallen messenger himself and he has minions that are fallen messengers and all the souls of the giants that are known as demons today serve him but this is where this comes from you're going to see that in just a moment it says and they took wives unto themselves and everyone respectively chose one woman for himself and they began to go unto them, and they taught them magical medicine, incantations, the cutting of roots, and taught them about plants. And the women became pregnant and gave birth to great giants, whose height were 300 cubits. Now, it doesn't mention it too much here, but you can find it in the homilies of the Clementine homilies and some other places the greek mythology the idea where you have these false mighty ones that can change shapes and do all these miraculous things like magicians the the messengers here they can change their shape you can see a little bit of it alluded to in other places but they change their shape into men and then mated with the women to have the giants they changed their shape into the monster, different types of animals and mated with them to make monsters. And it was the exploits of these and their children that are carried down by the demons to men and muses, especially when you go into Greek philosophy and you learn about how the Greeks, uh, they said that there wasn't a poet who wasn't mad or didn't lose himself. And that's still carried over into modern times where you have people writing songs and, and movie scripts and things like that under the inspiration of demons, but they're not aware of their own surroundings. They become possessed, if you will, and then they're just a conduit for these things to tell their stories. But that's how these mythological things carried on in Greek myth. That's how they came to be. It was just the stories perverted of what these people actually did. But it doesn't mention it in this one. If you are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls and you look up the fragments of the, the Book of the Giants, it goes into some detail about how they mated with the different animals, 200 of each kind, and begat monsters. And then if you've watched any, any of the things on uh, how there's giants that were fossilized into mountains and things of that nature you'll also see giant horses on occasion or giant elephant giant crocodile i think there's a dolphin in one of them that's an island now uh, this is where they come from okay but also the stories about monsters and in titans and things of that nature that's where this comes from they're perverted 
but from truthful, actual accounts of what happened. All right, back on track here. It says, and the women became pregnant and they gave birth to great giants whose height were 300 cubits. There's another part that says that they were, it wasn't 300, it was 300 or 3,000 Elim. That's what, that's what this one says, 3,000 Ls. Yeah, I don't know. This is, I'm going to have to find a different version. This is rather tragic. I think they've, they've changed it. But they did that on purpose. 300 Ls, if you'll take the time to look up what an L is and then do the measurements, these people or these giants were one or over a mile tall, like 1.2 miles tall. And that's also alluded to in, I believe it's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the exhortation, where it says they're mountains high. They were literally like the titans of old and then the their children were smaller and their children were smaller and the giants that are more common to us from that era i don't know why but they it seems that this one was changed it's tragic thank you for pointing that out <clears throat> so it says these giants consumed the produce of all the people until the people detested feeding them so the giants turned against the people in order to eat them. And they began to sin against birds, wild beasts, reptiles, and fish. And their flesh was devoured, the one by the other, and they drank blood. And then the earth brought an accusation against the oppressors. And Azazel who's also mentioned as the scapegoat, if you're familiar with Yikra Leviticus and what you have, what you have the Azazel goat and Yahuwah's goat for whose sacrifice and who's brought off into the wilderness to carry away the sins of the people. This is where that was first happening. But it says, and Azazel taught the people the art of making swords and knives and shields and breastplates. And he showed their chosen ones bracelets, decorations, shadowing of the eye with antinimity or atomony, right? Makeup. And this is particularly there's a witchcraft or a magic type of putting on makeup too, where you can change your face. This is something that John taught also witnesses of. But you can find that Jezebel or Jezebel was doing something of that nature as well when she was um when she was killed ornamentation the beautifying of the eyelids right all kinds of precious stones and all coloring tinctures and alchemy and there were many wicked ones and they committed adultery and erred and all their conduct became corrupt uh, a masraz taught incantation and the cutting of roots, and a maros, the resolving of incantations, or to undo them. And Barakiel, astrology, and Kokareel, the knowledge of the signs. I can't remember all of these names because the, the English is a little weird, but this one is the lightning of El right, taught astrology, the star of El, all right, Kokab or Kokariel is the knowledge of the signs or the constellations. Tamel taught the scene of the stars, and Asdriel taught the course of the moon, as well as the deception of man, or how to enchant men. And the people cried, and their voice reached unto the Shamayim. Then Mikael, Seraphel, and Gabriel observed carefully from the Shemaim, and they saw much blood being shed upon the earth, and all the oppression being wrought upon the earth. All right, so reading through this, we're, uh, we're coming upon a realization that this this PDF translation was updated at some point, and 
I've had the copy on my phone for a while. This one was a little newer, but both of them are different than what they originally were. So I'm sorry for that. And we're probably going to be missing a few things, which I'm, I'm greatly sorry for. This isn't everything that was listed originally. You had Mikael, Oriel, Sur uh, Suriel, Raphael, and Gabriel. And those were the five that were mentioned in this version originally that had overheard what was being done. There's a total of seven chief messengers that are before the throne of our Mashiach in the Shamayim. And they're mentioned and alluded to in a few different places. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Gabriel, who appeared to, Z to Zakar Yahu to announce the birth of Yahu Kanan, his son, and also appeared to Miriam to announce the birth of our Mashiach. Mikael is the chief over the people, as mentioned by Daniel. And in the book of the Shepherd of Hermas, you see he specifically is the messenger that is over the righteous people of the elect that are not currently in sin. Any of them that transgress or fall into temptation are handed over to our Mashiach for nurturing and to, to be brought back to the truth. Then you have Oriel, the light of El, who has dominion over all the luminaries. And he's the chief one that's, that speaks to Hanok throughout and shows him those things. There's also Raphael, the healer of El, who is specifically mentioned in the book of Tobi Yahu, or what they call Tobit. And he's the messenger that appears to, to him, goes with his son and helps to uh, have them accomplished uh, the things that he was going to do which if you want to know you should read that book it's very well put together it also shows you how you can keep some of the festivals outside of the land to the best of your ability but long story short this version's different it's got a few things i've already noticed and it's different from what i remember so i am very very sorry about that i'm going to try to point out anything and then we have uh others looking at different versions just in case something else pops up but without wasting too much time we're going to go ahead and keep reading so th those five it says three here but those five observed carefully from the shamayim and they saw much blood being shed upon the earth and all the oppression being wrought upon the earth and they said to one another the earth from her empty foundation has brought the cry of their voice unto the gates of Shamayim. And now, Kodesh ones of Shamayim, the inner beings of people are putting their case before you, pleading, bring our judgment before the Most High. And they said to Yahuwah, it says of the potenance right here. Of Isn't the agents. Right, the potenance. <sighs> They call the, the little horn the potent, right? This, he's, but Yahuwah of ages, for he is Yahuwah of masters and the Elohim of Elohim and the king of kings and the seed of his splendor stands throughout all the generations of the world. Your name is Kodesh and Baruch and magnificent throughout the whole world. You have made everything, and with you is the authority for everything. Everything is naked and open before your sight, and you see everything. And there is nothing which can hide itself from you. You see what Azazel has done, how he has taught all forms of oppression upon the earth. All forms of oppression, warfare, the dividing of people by class through wit riches or different precious metals, giving of uh, trinkets and things to be worn, like jewelry, makeup, and the things that divide and separate and cause, you know, issues in the world. As you just read, he was the direct responsible agent of it. And they revealed eternal secrets which are performed in Shemaim and which man learned. Moreover, Shemyaza, 
to whom you have given power to rule over his companions. Cooperating, they went in unto the daughters of the people on earth, and they lay together with them, with those women, and defiled themselves, and revealed to them every kind of sin. As for the women, they gave birth to giants to the degree that the whole earth was filled with blood and oppression. And now, behold, the Kadosh one will cry, and those who have died will bring their suit up to the gate of Shemaim. Their groaning has ascended into Shemaim, but they could not get out from before the face of the oppression that is being wrought on earth. And you know everything even before it came to existence. And you see this thing, but you do not tell us what is proper for us that we may do regarding it. And then spoke the Most High. Now, you see, he didn't just take charge and start doing things until he was asked about it. This is something to keep in mind. He's sovereign over all things, but he says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. He makes it very clear. It's the uh, it, like a father. You don't just interdict yourself and start doing things, or at least if you're following his example, you wait until they ask you before you help. Not to be rude or mean, but because you want to give them a chance to, you know, do things. and not You want them to learn, right? This is, and then spoke the Most High, the Great and Kadosh One. And he sent Asorel to the son of Lemek, saying, Tell him in my name, hide yourself, and reveal to him th the end of what is coming. For the earth and everything will be destroyed, and the deluge or flood is about to come upon all the earth, and all that is in it will be destroyed. And now instruct him in order that he may flee, and his seed will be preserved for all generations. And secondly, Yahuwah said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and throw him into the darkness. And he made a hole in the desert which is called Dudael, and cast him there. He threw on top of him rugged and sharp rocks, and he covered his face in order that he may not see light, and in order that he may be sent into the fire on the great day of judgment, and give life to the earth which the messengers have corrupted, and he will proclaim life for the earth, that he is giving life to her. And all the children of the people will not perish through all the secrets of the messengers, which they taught to their sons. And the whole earth has been corrupted by Azazel's teaching of his own actions, and write upon him all sin. The other virgin said, therefore, all the sin shall be attributed to him. And that was the first mention of what's alluded to on a yearly basis when you keep the Day of Atonement. And they put all the sins of the people on the Azazel goat and then have it taken off into the wilderness. It says, And to Gabriel, Yahuwah said, Proceed against those or the bastards or the illegitimate children and the reprobates and against the children of adultery and destroy the children of adultery, and expel the children of the watchers from among the people, and send them against one another, so that they may be destroyed in the fight. For length of days have they not. They will beg you everything for their fathers on behalf of themselves, because they hope to live an eternal life. They hope that each one of them will live a period of 500 years. And that never happened. If you remember, we already covered that in the 480th year of Noah's life is when he said, my being shall not strive with man forever. Their, day, their number is 120 years. 
And then the flood came in the 600th year of Noah's life. And to Mikael, excuse me, Yahuwah said, make known to Shemyaza and to all or and to the others who are with him, who fornicated with the women, that they will die together with them in all their defilement. And when they and all their children have battled with each other, and when they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for 70 generations underneath the rocks of the ground until the day of their judgment and of their consummation, until the eternal judgment is concluded. In those days, they will lead them into the bottom of the fire and in torment in the prison where they will be locked up forever. And at the time when they will burn and die, those who collaborated with them will be bound together with them from henceforth unto the end of all generations. It, the messengers, like Azazel, are immortal beings. They're, they don't physically cease to exist, but they're, they die in the sense that they're no longer to have any place in this world or in the Shamayim. The second death is when there's no longer death in the world. It gets thrown into the lake of fire along with everyone who's wicked. But that would be after their bodies are resurrected and the soul never dies. The inner being is immortal, created on the first day before it was put in the body of Adam and everybody who's ever existed. Your inner being was created on the first day, which we'll cover in the book of Yob Elim. But um, a lot of people like to think that once you're dead or once there's an ever after, then you're going to cease to exist. But that's actually a heretical thing that Simon the Magician tried to put forward that you can see in the recognitions of Clement. The idea of eternal fire and undying worms is something our Mashiach says three times in a row for emphasis and to prove the fact as absolutely true. It's a horrible thing to even contemplate, but it's that fear that should keep you from sinning because you don't want to go there. It says, and at that time when they will burn and die, those who already read that one, sorry. And destroy all the inner beings of pleasure and the children of the watchers, for they have done unrighteousness to man. Destroy. I don't know what's worded in the other one, but this is different from how it used to be worded. Destroy the unrighteous from the face of the earth, and every inequitous deed will end, and the plant of righteousness and truth will appear forever, and he will plant joy. And then all the righteous ones will escape and become the living ones until they multiply and become tens of hundreds. And all the days of their youth and the years of their retirement, they will complete in shalom. And in those days, the whole earth will be worked in righteousness. All of here planted with trees and will find Baraka. Yeah, this is worded quite different from what I'm remembering, so I'm sorry. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'm going to have to do something better next time. I think we're going to have to type up our own and go through the different versions to get it at the accurate one. I have the Hallelujah version in paperback downstairs, too. And it used to be quite in line with the, the PDF here, but this has changed. So it says, and in those days, the whole earth will be worked in righteousness, all of here planted with trees and will find Baraka. And they shall plant pleasant trees upon her vines. And he who plants a vine upon her will produce wine for plentitude. And every seed that is sown on her, one measure will yield a thousand measures. And one measure of olives will yield 10 measures of, of presses of oil. And you cleanse the earth from all unrighteousness, and from all defilement, and from all oppression, and from all sin, and from all inequity 
in which, or sorry, which is being done on earth. Remove them from the earth. And all the children of the people will become righteous. And all nations shall worship and barak me. And they will all prostrate themselves to me. And the earth shall be cleansed from all pollution and from all sin and from all plague and from all suffering. And it shall not happen again that I shall send these upon the earth from generation to generation and forever. And in those days I shall open the storerooms of Baraka, which are in the Shemaim, so that I shall send them down upon the earth over the work and the toil of the children of man. And shalom and truth shall become partners together in all the days of the world and in all the generations of the world. It says, before these things happened, Hanok was hidden, and no one of the children of the people knew by what he was hidden and where he was. And his dwelling place, as well as his activities, were with the watchers and the Kodosh ones, or the Kodashim. And so were his days. And I, Hanok, began to Barak Yahuwah of Elohim and the king of the creation. At that moment, the watchers were calling me, and they said to me, Hanok, scribe of righteousness, go and make known to the watchers of Shemaim, who have abandoned the high Shemaim, the Kadosh eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, as their deeds move the children of the world, and have taken unto themselves wives. They have defiled themselves with great defilement upon the earth. Neither will there be shalom unto them, nor the forgiveness of sin. For their children delight in seeing the murder of their beloved ones. That doesn't read the same. I'm sorry. It, what it was getting at, it says, But they shall groan and beg forever over the destruction of their children, and there shall not be shalom unto them even forever. What happened was they reaped what they sowed, as the messengers or watchers had begotten the giants, and they didn't cry or have any concern over our Creator's children, as they did evil to them. And, you know, what was already mentioned, they started eating them, forced them to do things, and it, it was quite horrible for them. In like manner, they reap what they sowed. They had no repentance. They didn't, they had to watch their children have what happened to them as our creator had to watch what his happened to his children through their actions okay it's the same thing that you can see in adam how adam had regard for our creator is what he had to deal with with his own children same thing with aharon or aaron where he had killed the two houses with the idol and then the strange fire that consumed his two eldest sons that pattern there it, is what you can see what happened with the watchers. All right. Just one moment. All right. So we're going to finish reading this section to chapter 15 at least. And then next week we're going to reread this, but it's going to be from the Hallelujah version that we have on the hard copy. So everyone can see the difference from what was originally in here and what's being tampered with and changed for whatever reason. And then ask yourself why. That's, that's a question for another time. But we'll keep going. This is chapter 13, his intercession for Azazel. It says, as for Hanok, he proceeded and said to Azazel, and I don't remember him actually saying that to him. He went to the watchers, right? It says, there will be no shalom unto you. A grave judgment has come upon you. They will put you in bonds, and you will not have an opportunity for rest and supplication because you have taught unrighteousness and because you have 
sown or shown to the people deeds of shame, unrighteousness, and sin. Then I went and spoke to all of them together, and they were all frightened, and fear and trembling seized them. And they begged me to write for them a memorial prayer in order that there may be for them a prayer of forgiveness, and so that I may raise their memorial prayer unto Yahuwah of Shemaim. Now, there's a mention of Yahuwah of Shemaim, and there's the Yahuwah that appears on earth to men, which, if anyone's familiar, that would be the difference between the Father, who is the Yahuwah of Shemaim, or the Most High, and then his Son, who is the Yahuwah or the Elohim that appeared to men throughout all ages. And the fact that there's two named Yahuwah can be seen in Genesis chapter 19 at the at Sodom and Gomorrah being burned with fire and brimstone or sulfur. It can be seen in Psalm 110, Psalm 2. It, there's... Uh, in the foretellers, it talks about the Yahuwah who was formed and the, the one who is ever existent. Psalm 8 talks about how he was, our Mashiach was begotten before all things, but he was with him as a master workman while they were being created. So these things are alluded to all throughout Scripture, but it's specifically mentioned in detail after he came in the flesh and he revealed himself to his taught ones. And then you can see that you can see it fully in like the apostolic constitutions or the writings of Irenaeus or um, uh, the uh, recognitions of Clement. There, he's very frank about these things. And again, when you look at the placeholders, where in the Nomnia Sacra, the placeholders throughout the uh, original Greek writings that we had, he, our Mashiach is called. Yahushua Mashiach, our Yahua, or Yahua Yahushua Mashiach, all throughout the renewed covenant writings. He is not his own father, but he inherited the name above every name, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, ob willing, we'll we'll be able to see that more often. But there, they make a distinction here. Yahua of Shamayim is the father. It says, for as for themselves, from henceforth they will not be able to speak, nor will they raise their eyes unto Shemaim as a result of their sins which they have, or which have been condemned. And then I wrote down their memorial prayers and the petitions on behalf of their spirits and the deeds of each one of them on account of the fact that they have prayed in order that there may be for them forgiveness of sin and a length of days. And I went and sat down upon the waters of Dan in Dan, which is on the southwest of Hermon. And I read, and remember Dan means judgment, right? And I read their memorial prayers until I fell asleep. And behold, a dream came to me, and visions fell upon me, and I saw a vision of plagues, so that I may speak to the children of Shemaim and reprimand them. And upon my awaking, I came unto them while they were all conferring together, and Lisyael, which is located between Lebanon and Sanser, while weeping, and their faces covered. And I recounted before them all the visions that I had seen in sleep and began to speak those words of righteousness and to reprimand the watchers of Shemaim. Just one moment. So chapter 14 of Hanak here, it says, this is the book of the words of righteousness and the chastisement of the eternal watchers in accordance with how Yahuwah the Kadosh and Great One had commanded in, his, in this vision. I saw in my sleep 
what I now speak with my tongue of flesh and the breath of the mouth, which Yahuwah the Great One has given to man so that he may speak with it. Sorry about that. And so that he may have comprehension with his heart as Yahuwah the Great One has created and given it to man. Accordingly, he has created me and given me the word of comprehension so that I may reprimand the watchers, the children of Shemaim. I wrote down your prayers, so it appeared in visions, for your prayers will not be heard throughout all the days of eternity, and judgment is passed upon you. Now, please keep in mind how this sounds when you're reading it. It doesn't really make sense in, in the way it's written. And next week, we're going to go over this again, but a, a more clear version and pay attention to the differences where it makes sense it's coherent this stuff is a little it's kind of out there so i'm sorry for that but i want you to see there's a difference in the translation and it wasn't always that way this pdf was different i don't know how it got updated on my computer or on my phone like that but it did and uh, now you can see that there's something going on here but pay attention to the things that are different and why. Think about why. But it says, From now on, you will not be able to ascend into Shemaim unto all eternity, but you shall remain inside the earth imprisoned all the days of eternity. Before that, you will have seen the destruction of your beloved sons, and you will not have their treasures, which will fall before your eyes by the sword. And your petitions on their behalf will not be heard, neither will those on your own behalf, which you offer weeping and praying. And you will not speak even a word contained in the book which I wrote. And behold, I saw the clouds, and they were calling me in a vision, and the fogs were calling me, and the course of the stars and the lightnings were rushing me and causing me to desire. And in the vision, the winds were causing me to fly and rushing me high up into Shemaim. The, the stars and the lightnings you might not know how they're connected, but it's a very interesting phenomenon. If you ever pay attention to lightning at night, you should see the stars flashing as well. And if you know what elves and spirits are, as it relates to high altitude lightning, it comes right out of the firmament and then down. So really awesome stuff. I think Founded Earth Brothers has some things on that too in their videos. You might want to check it out. But the, it's mentioned in the book of Hanok, and we'll get to that eventually. However, the lightnings, eth, and the thunders, and the courses of the stars are all given by Yahuwah for parts of the signs of what's coming and the things that are happening. There's another, there's only a fragment or fragments of a scroll. They call it the divination scroll, if I remember correctly, in the new translation. But it talks about, um, and it's like the type and shadow uh, of things to come. If you remember, what happened in the land was like a microcosm of what was going on in the world. And in the same way that the Kohanim and the Luiim had inside knowledge that the taught ones would be able to discern these things later on. But they had in the land that when lightnings would strike in certain places or certain types of things and in the, in the stars at certain times, meant different things and so if they heard lightning and thunder over in some quadrant then they knew that something else was going to happen or this and that you'd have to look at it and, but it lists the course of the moon through the zodiac and then it had the different a few different pro tense of things that would happen and that's like a microcosm or a little version of what you can see throughout the book of revelation which if you study the anti mashiach or the Antichrist for Dummies videos, you'll see that ad nusum, where they just go over in detail the signs and the stars, the accompanying events, and then eventually you also have the voices, the, the soundings, and the, um, 
the thunders from the Shamayim that are literally happening in the world. And this is just an allusion to that, but it all comes from our creator. Okay. So it says, verse 9, And I kept coming into Shamayim until I approached a wall, which was built of white marble and surrounded by tongues of fire. And it began to frighten me. And I came into the tongues of the fire and drew near to the great house, which was built on white of white marble. And the inner walls were like mosaics of white marble, the floor of crystal the ceiling like the path of the stars and lightnings between which stood fiery cherubim and their shamayim of water. And flaming fire surrounded the walls and its gates were burning with fire. And I entered into the house, which was hot like fire and cold like ice. And there was nothing inside it. So fear covered me, and trembling seized me. And as I shook and trembled, I fell upon my face and saw a vision. And behold, there was an opening before me, and a second house which is greater than the former, and everything was built with tongues of fire. And in every respect it excelled the other, in splendor and great honor, to the extent that it is impossible for me to recount to you concerning its majesty and greatness. As for its floor, it was of fire, and above it was lightning and the path of the stars. And as for the ceiling, it was flaming fire. And I observed and saw inside it a lofty throne its appearance was like crystal and its wheels like the shining sun and i heard the voice of the cherubim and from beneath the throne were issuing streams of flaming fire it was difficult to look at and yahuwah the great majesty was sitting upon it as for his gown which was shining more brightly than the sun. It was whiter than any snow. Now, you see, the great majesty, this would be the father, and his, his garment, what he perceived in the vision of his, just the garment of the father was more bright than the sun. Our Mashiach, when he was transfigured, his face was shining as the sun. And his garments were exceedingly white, right? But this is brighter, and this is why he says the Father is greater than I, okay? Now, this is a vision because the Father himself is not encompassed by any. He, he, he has no form that we can look upon, but he's seen him in the Ruach, if you will. None of the messengers was able to come in and see the face of the excellent and sp the splendid one, and no one of flesh can see him. We can see our Mashiach, though. And this is where it says that the Father dwells in unapproachable or inaccessible light. Okay? The flaming fire was round about him, and a great fire stood before him. No one could come near unto him from among those that surrounded the tens of millions that stood before him. He needed no counsel, but the most Kodesh ones who are near to him neither go far away at night nor move away from him. Until then, I was prostrate on my face, covered and trembling. And Yahuwah called me with his own mouth and said to me, Come near to me, Hanok, and to my Kodesh word. And he lifted me up and brought me near to the gate, but I continued to look down with my face. 
And see, this one says one of the Kodashim came to me and woke me up, and he made me rise up and approach. Right. And if you remember, no one can hear his voice and live, right? It's only our Mashiach who can perceive the Father and, and converse with him. And then he is the mediator between Elohim and Min. So one of the things that you'll notice, especially if you look at the vision in Gad the seer, you had the the one coming out of the sun holding the lamb despised and rejected and then the the man with the garment down to his feet with the golden band it's it's different it's all our mashiach again and again and again there but it was a vision to gad in a way that he can comprehend in the same way you can see things happening or when he tells him no man's heard the voice of the father but then they hear a voice from the shamayim saying this is my beloved hear him right? He said, that that wasn't for me, but that was for your benefit. It's not to confuse people, but it's, he's trying to be, he can only speak the truth. He is the truth. And while those things happen to benefit men to believe that he was someone we should listen to, he, it, we should also acknowledge that was not the voice of the father that spoke. He speaks through mediators because we can't perceive him. Right, we we can know him through the word. That's always going to be true. And when he comes to dwell with men after sin is removed, then we're going to be dwelling in the presence of the Father and of the Lamb. And that's going to be a time where there is no more sin, there is no confusion. But you still you <clears throat> you'll never be able to perceive him and look upon him. He's not flesh. Right, we're going to be hearing him through his word and through our Mashiach, just like we have been. There, you know, I'm sure that starts to make more sense to you now. But that's why he said, no man can see me and live to Moshe. And you can see the same thing right here. All right, so chapter 15, I believe this is the last one we're going to cover for today. It, we'll we'll see what it gets to in just a moment. But Hanok intercedes to Yahuwah for the watchers of Shemaim and their judgment. It says, but he raised me up. And if you remember, or you might not know, the watchers, it mentions in the Clementine homilies, they saw the deeds of men and they were wayward and they felt, well, if we went down and we could show them how men are supposed to act. And they were given permission to do so. So they went down and changed themselves into different forms and whatever. And then they became like men to teach men. But with becoming like them, they were also given the uh, temptations that come upon men. And they came to it. That's why they lusted after women. And as they were from above and came down, so someone from below went up. And you can see that where they lost the ability to be here Hanok is given the he's made like a messenger he he will tell you later on that this is going to be his dwelling place forever but it's not for yet and he's actually escorted into paradise until the consummation of the times our mishiach talks about it in parable form excuse me about the hundredfold reward in Irenaeus or Irenaeus however you want to pronounce that makes it fully elucidated or enlightened us on the matter that the hundredfold reward are for those. And just like the, the men who are virgins for the sake of Mashiach, they never marry, but dedicate themselves to evangelizing and they don't concern themselves with matters of the world. They're made like messengers they are guaranteed a place, a spot better than sons and daughters. It says in Yeshiyahu. Um, but they are guaranteed to be in the Shamayim before the presence of the Father, like the messengers. So there's a, from the lowest and up, it's like it says the, the last shall be, or the first shall be last and the last shall be first. This is the first type and picture of that that you can also see echoed through time. This is, but he raised me up and said to me with his voice, Hanok. I then heard, do not fear Hanok righteous man, scribe of righteousness, come near to me and hear my voice. And tell the watchers of Shemaim on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede. 
it is meet or good for you that you should that you intercede on behalf of man and not man on your behalf for what reason have you abandoned the high kodesh and eternal shemaim and slept with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of the people taking wives acting like the children of the earth and begetting giant sons surely you used to be Kodesh, spiritual, the living ones, possessing eternal life. But now you have defiled yourselves with women, and with the blood of the flesh, or the blood of the flesh, begotten children. You have lusted with the blood of the people, like them producing blood and flesh, which die and perish. On that account, I have given you wives in order that seeds might be sown upon them and children born by them, so that the deeds that are done upon the earth will not be withheld from you. Indeed, you formerly, you were spiritual, having eternal life and immortal in all the generations of the world. And this is alluded to by our Mashiach when he's talking about the resurrection he says you'll be like the messengers where you won't be mating with women anymore he says that is why formerly I did not make wives for you for the dwelling of the spiritual beings of Shemaim is Shemaim but now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits and the flesh shall be called and th this is important okay this is the verdict against what we call demons today and what they're given to do from uh, under men okay but now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits or ruachoth and the flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth because their dwelling shall be upon the earth and inside the earth evil spirits have come out of their bodies because from the day that they were created from the kodesh or from the kodeshim they became the watchers their first origin is the spiritual foundation they will become evil upon the earth and shall be called evil spirits yeah well, you'll see next week it makes more sense, but we'll keep reading. The dwelling of the spiritual beings of Shemaim is Shemaim, but the dwelling of the spirits of the earth, which are born upon the earth, is in the earth. The spirits of the giants oppress each other. They will corrupt, fall, be excited, and fall upon the earth and cause sorrow they eat no food nor become thirsty nor find obstacles and these spirits shall rise up against the children of the people and against women or and against the women because they have proceeded forth from them all right it looks like we have one more right there so it says from the days of the slaughter and destruction and the death of the giants and the spiritual beings of the spirit and the flesh from which they have proceeded forth, which will corrupt without incurring judgment, they will corrupt until the day of the great conclusion, until the great age is consummated, until everything is concluded upon the watchers and the wicked ones. It, meaning that the demons, if you will, the evil spirits that proceed from the bodies of the giants will be able to proceed and do what they're doing until the consummation, okay? Until the final judgment against all these things. And that's why you, you see them saying, we know who you are. Are you coming to judge us before the time? You remember, if you recall what our Mashiach hears from these things when he's casting them out of men, And so to the watchers on whose behalf you have been sent to intercede, 
who were formerly in Shemaim say to them, You were once in Shemaim, but not all the mysteries of Shemaim are open to you, and you only know the rejected mysteries, those ones you have broadcast to the women in the hardness of your hearts, and by those mysteries the women and men multiply evil deeds upon the earth. Tell them, therefore you shall have no shalom. And that's a theme that we hear throughout the scripture too. There is no rest or shalom for the wicked, right? But uh, while they have eternal torment, uh, these ones are buried. And after this, they were buried and then they suffered like Azazel um, until they're going to be taken out and condemned and thrown into the lake of fire where there's eternal fire and undying worms. There is no end to that. In the same way, as we'll read in the uh, animal apocalypse there, the blind sheep and all the sinners and everyone's also going to be judged and thrown into that lake of fire, which is never quenched and the worms never die. Neither do the inner beings or bodies at that time, but they suffer eternity of torment. So it is an absolute horrible thing to even contemplate, and it's something that we should strive with all of our inner being to not be there, which is only through an acknowledgement of the great offering of himself that was done on the behalf of our Mashiach by the will of his Father, and then humble obedience to the truth because we love him. So thank you all for your time. Next week, we're going to go through probably the same chapters here in the different version, and you can see it, it reads quite a bit different. I'm highly disappointed with this one, but I'm willing it will still be edifying for everyone that happens to listen to this. So we'll see you next week. You have a wonderful week and uh, you know, love your father and your neighbor as yourself.